So, what is the end? The end is monarchy. One man, Jesus, who will be king, who will reign a righteous rule, who will share his authority with those whom he has trained through suffering, through affliction, through discipline, to share his rule with him. What do we call those people? We call them the church. And bear in mind that the word church is a very poor translation of the Greek word ecclesia, which is essentially a governmental assembly. So if we're members of the church, we're members of a governmental assembly, which will be headed up by one righteous man, Jesus. That's God's solution, and I believe there is no other solution. I believe in a certain sense, if we're trying to arrange for some other solution, we're wasting our time and our energy. We've got lots to do within the context of God's revelation. Now, I want to point out two, I think, incontrovertible principles. You may not think them so. But what we are dealing with is the corruption of human nature caused by sin. And notice that when Paul speaks about fierce times, the reason he gives will be, will, is, men will be. And he lists 18 moral or ethical blemishes. The root cause of the problems in the world is not nuclear fission. It's human character. After all, the atom bomb didn't invent itself. Men invented it. Men used it. Men have invented all sorts of horrible instruments of destruction. It's men who are using them. So the root cause of the problems of humanity today is the moral and ethical corruption produced in humanity by sin. And if you'll accept the metaphor of corruption, which I believe is valuable, valid, there are two principles in the natural. All corruption is progressive. It doesn't get better. It always gets worse. And all corruption is irreversible. There is no way to turn back the working of corruption. I believe that applies to the world situation. I believe it applies to the world. The corruption in the world is progressive. It's never going to get better. It's always going to get worse. And it's irreversible. There is no way to reverse the process of corruption. So all Christian prayers and schemes and plans that are, whether they know it or not, directed to reversing corruption are a waste of time and probably money too. See, this is why we need biblical prophecy, because it saves us a lot of wasted time, effort and money. A lot of disappointment. Now please understand, I believe as Christians, we have an obligation to pray for our government within the parameters of the revealed will of God. I was speaking about this once some good many years ago, about the need to pray for the government. And at the end a lady came up to me, a dear lady, and she said, but Mr. Prince, doesn't the Bible teach that everything is getting worse and worse? I said, no. It teaches some things are getting worse and some things are getting better. And I'm one of the things that's getting better. <laughs> and you can be one of the things that's getting better too. You understand? This is not negative. It's realistic. You have to live within the parameters of the revealed, the revelation of God's Word. So, let's note also, and we'll return to this list, but let's note also that in the last time, this passage reveals there will be a great upsurge of the occult. For instance, in the same chapter, that's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, Paul says, Now as Jannes and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds 
disapproved concerning the faith. Notice the word corrupt? But those two names, Janis and Jambres, are the names of the two magicians in Egypt that resisted and opposed Moses and Aaron. And so when it talks about them, it's talking about the occult, the satanic supernatural. And please bear in mind that Satan is perfectly comp capable of working miracles. Any charismatic who believes that all miracles necessarily attest the truth is mistaken. Because the Bible says at the end, God, uh, Satan will do great miracles, but they will not be truth. They'll be lying wonders. Now it's interesting really because this conflict between Moses and Aaron and the magicians was not fought out on the natural plane. It wasn't a conflict of theology. And the battle in, for us in these last days is not going to be a conflict of theology. It's going to be a conflict of spiritual power. That's the decisive issue. And let me remind you of what happened when Moses and Aaron appeared before Pharaoh and said, let God's people go. And Pharaoh said, what sign can you show that this message is from God? And Moses said to Aaron, throw down your rod, our rod. And in the presence of Pharaoh, that rod became a snake. Now you might think that would convince Pharaoh, but it didn't. He said, wait a minute, I'll see what my magicians can do. And he called for them, and listen, the Bible says plainly, they threw down their rods and they became snakes. All right, supernatural, but satanic. That's not the end of the story, thank God. You know what happened next? Moses' snake and up the Egyptian snakes. And I, I just picture this so vivid to me. The magicians walked away with empty hands. They had no rod. <laughs> and Moses' rod was thicker and stronger than it had ever been. But it was fought out on the supernatural plane. And I want to tell you for sure, that's where we're going to have to fight. It's not going to be theology. It's not going to be merely doctrine. It's going to be who has the power of God. This is predicted nearly 2,000 years ago. The prediction is right in force today. The powers of the occult are increasing. Their boldness, their arrogance, their claims to superiority are increasing continually. But their folly will be made manifest to all men, as was the folly of Janis and Jambres.